Hi, this is Cherie with Rehash Fiber. Please join me for the final episode of Rehash Fiber Travel Adventures in Phoenix, Arizona. You don't want to miss this one because look at this beautiful yarn. It has been dyed with natural things from the Sonoran Desert. So check it out. Thanks to Tempe Yarn and Fiber again. Because of the business they do with other small businesses and the listings that they have on their website, I found Cheryl of Sonoran Desert Dyed Fibers. And I was intrigued because she does all her dyeing from items she finds in the desert. So I contacted her and she invited me out for a dyeing session and I learned how she dyes with the natural elements in the Sonoran Desert. It's fantastic. So join us. I've put together a pomegranate pot and this is just pomegranate skins and pomegranates and boil it off and then just let it simmer for a while. So I started this this morning, like around eight or nine o'clock. So those are whole pomegranates in there? It's, there's whole pomegranates and then okay. there's some that's just skins, it just depended on what I have because we have the bush out there. Mm -hmm. And so I just pulled off some of the dead stuff um, and some that I kept. And so when I put this in, what I'll do is I'll take a, uh, this has not been mordanted. So this is just plain fiber. And what is mordant? Mordant is, Mordant is French, is a French word for, it's, it's actually mordant, which is to bite on. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the dye to bite into the fabric. And so what the mordant does is it preps the fabric to allow the dye to bite in. The only mordant that I use is um, uh, alum, which is basically pickling salts. Same thing as when you're making pickles. And the other one I use is cream of tartar. These are things that tend to have tannins in them. So the other pot is eucalyptus bark. So you've got bark, you've got the tannin in the skins because they're very hard skinned, pomegranates are, and cochineal, which I have back here, which are the little bugs. They Where come, do you get those? They come off of uh, paddle cactuses. Okay. And um, so they actually, they're considered a parasite. Mm -hmm. And they eventually kill the cactus. So I always say I'm helping to save the cactuses because I go, I have welding gloves mm -hmm. and long scrapers. And I'm kind of like in the cactus scraping these white webby things off into a bucket. In South America, they, it's actually farmed and you how they do that process i don't know but cochineal has been used for centuries for basically anything and everything from red to orange to purple and it's still it's still one of the main dyes natural dyes that's used and in fact it's also a food dye the cochineal it, what it does is it gives off it's not it's not the blood of the of the bug it's just what it gives off hmm. and so um you'll see as we look at i have some that i started that i did earlier you just kind of it works best when it's hot it'll work when it's cold but it works quicker when it's hot and what i'll show you is that this of course i probably didn't need to tie that knot and I used the... Is that pantyhose? Uh-huh. When my mother was cleaning out all of her old drawers, she gave me all her old pantyhose. So it's just starting to color it at this point. So what we'll do is, in order to have kind of like a, a two-colored thing, is we'll put this, we'll leave this one in. And put it up kind of like that so that it stays. 
and we'll give that a little bit of time and then we'll see the difference in the color in it. The cochineal is our pinky purple sort of dye and I'm going to I have I have some rainwater so I'm going to dilute it. This is this is what's called dye liquor. This is the direct stuff. Let me I'll pull this out for you. That's that's what it looks like when it's been cooked and you can just keep cooking until you stop getting color. Okay. So again it's 55% BFL, 45% silk lace weight. So what I tend to do is Since I want to have color on both ends, and then I'll put a different color on this part, we'll just go ahead and start pushing this in. And this takes just a little bit longer because silk doesn't take up as quickly as wool does. And so that one will have to sit there for a little bit as it soaks in. And we'll let that little guy sit there like that. Over here, is our black bean dye. And so it's, you soak your black beans, your dried black beans, and the first batch of water that comes off, that you drain off of those before you're ready to cook them, that's the dye liquor. And that's, this is one of the few dyes that's done completely cold. If you heat black bean, it, it does what's called breaking the dye and you just get this not truly a non-color. It just turns into this um, kind of mushy, tannish gray sort of color. Mm. Versus, let's see, this one, this has been mordanted with alum. And what I want is I want the wool because that one will go a little bit faster. Do you soak it in the mordant? You do. The mordant mm -hmm. is a hot pot, a hot water. And everybody has their own kind of recipe for mordanting. They usually say 10% of the dry weight. So I did four 400 gram skeins. So I did 40 grams of um, uh, alum. Some people go more. Some people like a 20%. Some people go a little bit less. It just depends on what, it changes how your colors take. And, and the depth and, and everything of your colors. So this one, while that dye looks really kind of blah, looks kind of purple gray, the longer this sits in there, it will then begin to start to turn blue. And I'm gonna try and do a part, a two color, come on. Uh, We'll do it this way. Um, that way then we can keep some of it out of it. Um, what happens is the mordant interacts with the bean dye, the bean liquor, and after that sits in there for a little while, it will then take on a blue, a very a nice, not a navy blue, it's a nice deep blue, which you'll see when we look at some of the other colors. Um, this is some of, see that's what the cochineal is starting to do. But the longer we keep it in, the richer the color will get. We can take a peek here at pomegranate. Let's see, it's starting to get a little bit darker. Um, and the other pot that I did is eucalyptus bark. And you can find um, certain types of oak trees, walnut trees, certain tree barks will give you a good dye. So those would be some of the things you'd want to look at closer to home. You can also use the tree bark, not only as a dye, but also as a mordant. What I found was by using the eucalyptus bark as a mordant and then 
putting whatever, because this the color is not really strong, but then using that to dye either black bean or what I found was I could dye with red beet and the dye held. Normally red beet, you can, you get a really cool color from red beet, the kind of in this family, but just like that, it fades away. I mean, literally in the space of a couple days, it just disappears. Well, what I found was if I mordanted something, if I mordanted, mordanted the yarn with a tannin base, which was the eucalyptus bark, and then I used that and then dyed with the, the beets that I had cooked, the color stayed. I let it hang in the laundry room for a year, for a year just to see how long the color would stay. Mm. And a year later, it was still the original color. Mm. So this one, because I'm using the silk, I'm also gonna put it in a pantyhose. And this comes in really handy if you're using flowers and leaves and stuff like that, because then it's all in your, I made them, mm. it took me, okay. It took me a little while to realize that, you know, I wouldn't have to wash the yarn so much <laughs> if I protected it when it was in the dye. So this one, just kind of, and this is just, just bits and pieces of bark that I brewed basically as a tea. The silk just takes longer to get the water to stay in. And then generally, whenever I've, I do my dyeing, once I've gotten them to the point where I want them, I hang them out in the sun. Because a lot of times people are like, oh, well, is it, is it light fast? Is it water fast? You know, is the dye gonna stay or is it gonna be transient? So all of my skeins, once they're dyed, they go hang out in the sun. Not today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and then after they've hung in the sun to dry, then I rinse them in clear water. Then they hang out in the sun again, which means pretty much any amount of fading that's gonna happen is pretty much done. Mm -hmm. And I always tell people, you have to treat them, anything that's been naturally dyed, you can't plan on that, at least currently, or at least the stuff that I've done. You can't plan on that being something that's going to be on your wall and in the sun mm -hmm. because it'll it'll fade just so quickly um, how they got them to hold all those beautiful tapestries that were made hundreds of years ago that still have such great color i would love to know really how they got all those colors to stay because some of them are just so brilliant still and we'll let that one sit in there for a little while and I don't know if it's yeah it is starting to I don't know if you if the light will be able to pick it up it's starting to turn blue yeah I see it Yummy. from the beans mm -hmm. that is so cool canned beans won't do the same thing okay <laughs> mm. and then here's your cup of Oh, that's so pretty. That nice, deep, dark, rich color. And what I, in order to get a little bit of not just all solid colors is, that's kind of why I tie them and I'll do, like I'll let it soak maybe for a couple hours sometimes mm -hmm. on one end. And then I'll flip it around and I'll only let the other end in for 30 minutes, 40 minutes. So that's how you can pull your color variations mm -hmm. is the longer it has soaked, the more intense the color is. But by the, the other way I've done it is I wrap it around chopsticks and I start with the one end in and I let that soak. And then I unwind it just very slowly so that each part is in the dye slightly less time. So in essence, if I were to do that with this one, um, in my, my rags here, um, what I would do is I'd start by just 
soaking like this much of it in the dye and I'd keep all the rest of it out. And then after an hour or two, then I'd maybe let like that much go in because then this is still soaking and now this is going to be lighter and just keep going up until the last little bit. And so then that gets me my, what I consider a variegated mm -hmm. color. So that's some of the options that are available. I use the um, alum and the cream of tartar is they're not color modifiers. And so, cause you can take one of these and dip it in vinegar and you're going to get this wonderful color change. But the minute you put it into something else that has a different pH, that color is going to disappear. It's going to change. I found that out early on. That was some of the experimentation was because everybody said, oh, use some vinegar or um, uh, what was the other one? Baking soda. And you'll get these. And I did. I got some really cool colors. But as soon as I put them into plain water to rinse them, that cool color disappeared because now the pH was different. And so for natural dyes, pH is, the pH of your water is what determines. So, and I do tell people, depending on the water that you wash this in, your colors may shift. They're, they may not stay exactly the way they are, but that's natural. I mean, that's, that's part of it being a natural thing. So what I'm going to do is add, I think I'm going to take some of this dye liquor and put it into here. Without making too much of a mess, I hope. A bit different. It tends to go more. So this one is kind of a deep sort of color. This is going to be more of a pinky sort of color um, and can sometimes even go to an orange because of the, um, the alum. Actually, it looks like it's going to go more to the red. it easier, cleaner. <laughs> um, and let's see how our blue is doing. See our blue is really starting to develop. That's a pretty color. I like that. So we'll let that kind of keep doing its thing. Because now that the blue, now that the, the color, you can almost see in there that it's this isn't quite so murky mm -hmm. that it's it's got more color to it as opposed to when we first did it this one yeah, this one's gonna be a little bit more vivid and a lot of times what I do is I just keep dying until and what they say with the natural dyes is you just keep dying until you've exhausted the dye bath. And that too gives you your variations in color. The really pale pink. It's still a beautiful pink, but I can't get that pink until the dye bath has been more exhausted. Mm -hmm. um, this one we can do. I'm not sure if it'll, what it'll show us. as the color of the fiber or let's see so it ends up being a very pale color which if you're looking for pale is great or you can then use that along with something else that maybe requires mordant so like the black bean or the Palo Verde um, things like that so 
And that's where the fascination comes in. It's like you see this and you're like, oh, I like that color. But let's see what else we can do with it. Um, that's beautiful. So I'm going to see whether or not we can go any darker with this one. A sort of color. Oh. And let's see how it compares to the other one. See, this, is, this has a little bit more purple, mm -hmm. and this has a bit more pink to it. Mm -hmm. oh, it's gonna go. So this then, what I'll do is kind of do that. We'll let a little bit more of it in there. So how did you first get interested in this? Um, the dyeing part of it, I got interested in because uh, probably uh, 10, 12, 13 years ago or so, I got some yarn off of a, off of eBay from a place called the Natural Dye Studio in England. And what fascinated me was all of her yarns were dyed with natural products from the area of England that she lived in. And I knew eventually we were coming out this way uh, when my husband retired from the Air Force that we would be moving out here. And so um, that kind of began the wheels turning. I liked the idea of the natural dye versus the chemical dye. And I hadn't really been knitting that long at that point, but it still fascinated me to go that direction. So we kind of knew when we came out here that I wanted to do sheep and then kind of do the dyeing thing. And it got kind of jumbled up. <laughs> The sheep showed up far sooner than we thought they were going to. Um, and then I had to find my base uh, that I wanted to use for the dye. So I tried a number of different types of yarn to find out what took the dye the way I liked it and what made sense financially so that I could price reasonably. As it turns out, the BFL, this is actually British Blue Face Lester. Um, there is American blue face luster. It's the yarn, is, the fiber is a, it feels different and it's not the people who source this. This is done in the British wool barns and they go for the top of the line of the wool when it's being graded to get their product. Um, and I have always been really pleased with it. It's, it has dyed well. What I like about the British BFL is it has a really nice sheen. This is sock weight and also the um, uh, BFL in silk. And it just, you'll see when I show you some of the stuff that's already dyed, it just shimmers. And, um, and it blooms. It's, it's just got a really nice bloom. So both the color blooms and the yarn itself. Um, People do tend to go, depending on what I've dyed with, when I dye with pecan, something that has a lot of tannin in it, tends to make it feel like it's coarse, but the more you work it, as you're working your project, and then till you do your blocking, that's when everything just kind of lets go, and you get a softness that isn't there when you're, when you're actually knitting with it. Um, so I usually tell people, you know, just work your way through it, you'll, you'll be, happier at the end. <laughs> um, and so my husband was very supportive of me and just kind of helped me as we started finding more. I just tried to find plants that I could get a hold of. Um, the cochineal, uh, I would find cactuses that had it. And so I would go in with the gloves and scraping and in there and the Palo Verde trees that bloom in the spring. We go out and we're out there with five gallon buckets, taking blooms off. And of course we try to be very responsible about it. So we don't strip a whole tree of blooms. It's like, okay, so we take some from here and we take some from here. Well, there's different um, varieties of Palo Verde plants. So they give slightly different dye. Um, and so the more I played with it, cause I played with onion skins, which a lot of people have tried onion skin for stuff, but onions are not necessarily something that's native to Arizona. It grows here. Um, likewise, the, the pomegranate, uh, I think I read somewhere that pomegranate was a good dye source. And so I started to play with it. 
um, I tried red cabbage, which was really neat because I got this funky teal color out of it, but it didn't last very long. So I was like, okay, well that's not going to work. So I had to find dyes because I knew eventually I wanted to be able to sell them. I needed to make sure that what I dyed was going to stay looking mostly like what I was selling. And so it was about a year or so till I really was ready to go ahead and start putting it someplace where, where I felt comfortable selling it to people going, okay, it, I have tested it. I have left it out in the sun. I've dried it in the sun. This is the color that you're going to have, but you do have to take care of it. You know, you can't store it in a window, which is some of what makes it difficult to leave it in a store. Mm -hmm. um, and the other challenge is trying to sell it online. I originally thought I would try and do an online thing. These colors do not uh, translate to picture, online pictures. Mm -hmm. um, snapshots, they do seem to, but for whatever reason, I can take pictures and I know what I saw and that's not what the picture looks like. And so trying to have people who are trying to buy color by color. So um, that was definitely a challenge when trying to figure out how to market um, naturally dyed fibers. Um, I think the woman in England may have used a little bit more of a chemical process because she had much more consistency. Whereas mine tend to be much more one-off um, unless I'm dying for a big project. You know, somebody tells me I definitely need two skeins of the same color. Then I literally will wrap two skeins together in the same pantyhose or in the same pot to make sure that they're getting the same thing. Um, that's about the only way I can really be sure that they're going to look. Mm -hmm. And how many years have you been doing this? Um, we're in 2021. So I've been doing it probably since about 2011. We moved here in 2010, so 2011. Okay. Yeah. Very good. You see, once the dye leaves that, that has a very kind of pink pale pink so that changes when the dye has been does. squeezed yep. out of it it's beautiful though it's it's I love wow, these pinks now let's pretty. see what this one's looking like at this point so that's pretty too Howie. this one is going to be more denim. Mm -hmm. It's really gorgeous. So that's kind of what that color is going to be. And it'll it'll keep darkening up as we leave it there. I've had some where I've literally just put them in and they stand there for days and and they'll suck every bit of dye out of there. And the blue becomes this deep, deep denim blue. Um, this color would, would just, that's about the way, the only way I can get really saturated colors is literally, they will sit for days. Cool. Um, we can look at this one. Okay, so now this one's been kind of squeezed out. So it's got kind of a reddish, um, reddishness to it. It's got like a rose color. And the tea even has a little bit of that sort of color to it as well. But it's, um, this is the silk. So this would have more, it takes longer for this to, to pick up the color because of the silk being in there. Um, and what I can do, do I have, I do, I have another one that's, <laughs> cow things, okay, so we'll stick that back in there, and we'll see what this one's doing. You 
you know this one's still staying pretty light so I didn't I obviously didn't have as much um, pomegranate in there as I thought I did um, that gold color so we have Palo Verde we have this is alum and pomegranate this was that gray adventure I told you about this is Apache plume that's the the weed I was telling you about that we found this is some pomegranate this should be pecan nope that's pomegranate you just not see those two are both pomegranate um, so you have that and then this should be pecan husks and the browns that's pecan husk. There's some of your denim blue. Mm, it's so pretty. This one is probably also, that's a black bean, which then came out blue green. This is the cochineal and pomegranate. So I had it in pomegranate and then after it dried, then I did it in the cochineal and that brought out that purple. And then this is a way to see the variant. Uh, those are all pomegranate. Oh, I'm sorry, they're all cochineal. So it's just varying vats. This should be pomegranate, yeah. So pomegranate can run into the browns as well as the gold. And there's your blues and the blue greens. And sometimes this one should be Palo Verde. Yep, that's Palo Verde, which can run into the greens and the dark green. Um, cochineal. Um, that's more cochineal. So that's kind of what some of those colors look like. Now, the silk. So this is alum cochineal and pomegranate so the gray was the pomegranate and then i over dyed with the cochineal and that gave it the purple look um palo verde and here's pomegranate done with the silk this would be pecan with the silk the blues don't take in quite the same any true blues in here. Whoop. Probably not. That one's a black bean. I don't think I have any of the dark blues. Some space. I'll do the blue but then plan to put the purple or the cochineal over top of it because blue and pink make purple. So some of it is you play with the color wheel too is if you're trying to get to a green you go for what is it blue and yellow so i'll have palo verde and i'll mix it with black bean so i usually could the palo verde ends up being a stronger the yellow ends up being a stronger dye so i'll dye first in the black bean and then over dye with the palo verde the yellow and that's when i can get my green or my teal apparently the one year i was able to do it and i had skeins of yarn that looked like the seahawks uniforms mm. which several people were like can you make more of this and i'm going mm, no probably maybe i don't know because <laughs> it just depended but the seahawk fans decided that those those skeins Amanda said, in no time at all, as soon as anybody saw them and they were Seahawks fans, they were like, oh, I have to have this. <laughs> Off it went. <laughs> that one's, I don't know what that one is. Okay, so that's pomegranate. So those three are all from pomegranate? Um, no, this is black bean and Palo Verde. The black bean, unfortunately, at this point has faded out, but the yellow is the Palo Verde. This is pomegranate. This is 
pomegranate. This is pomegranate. It was Duke, Abby, and Uno. That actually was a father, mother, and lamb. So that was the family blend. Um, some of it is, let's see, this would be Tunis Blend 2014. So what I do is I put the name of the sheep so that I know instead of having a die lot or a lot number and people are trying to get the same ones or they start going, oh, I like this one, this one, and this one. I said, you have to understand, this is one sheep or this is this set of sheep. This is a different set of sheep. And this is a third set of sheep. So the fiber is gonna be a little bit different because they're different sheep. And they're not all, you know, it's like I'll just do these two sheep all together because of the fiber, the way it came out. Let's see what we've got here. Kind of get to see the end. The end of the time. So that's our, that's that one. And there's your denim blue. with your modeled colors there because I didn't quite get the pink but you can see that the part that was mordanted was the pink or not mordanted was the pink and the other says more purple to it and then we'll take a peek at our other ones That's the eucalyptus bark. It's got kind of that rosy, rosy brown sort of color. And last but not least, let's see what our pomegranate did. Yep, that's a lighter, lighter pomegranate patch than usual. So obviously I didn't have quite enough skins in there this time. But what'll happen is if I over dye it with something or even the pomegranate, that'll end up taking darker and then we'll have a lighter section or vice versa. I'll set the other section in, let it get really dark and then we'll have two tone.
that? Was that fun or what? And I kept showing the llama because he was the guard llama. And the moment he saw me, he had his eye on me like the evil eye. And I got such a tickle out of that because he was doing his job eyeballing me. So it was funny. Um, and just all the animals are great. And the dog at the end, he's so cute. He was super muddy because it had rained. So she kind of kept him behind the fence so that he wouldn't get all over me. So anyway, it was great. So look at this beautiful yarn. When she had those bends out, I knew I wanted to get some. And I just eyeballed the colors that popped at me. And I do want to do this in a sweater with all three of these colors. So that will come one day soon. So on my last day in Phoenix, I wanted to do a really good hike with a great view. So I went to the Phoenix Mountain Preserve and there there is a hike called the Summit or Piestua Peak. And it is 1.2 miles of almost straight up hiking. They rate it there kind of like ski runs. This was a blue to black diamond. And it was a very challenging 1.2 miles, but worth every minute with the 360 views of the whole region. So I want you to take a look. So not only was that hike breathtaking and I felt like oh, I'm on top of the world, it was really neat because of its short distance, it's doable even though it's hard and it's doable by a variety of people. So I encountered a runner as I was coming down, he runs up and down. So he passed me both ways um, running it. And then I came across somebody with a disability taking very tiny little slow steps, still did it. There was a grandpa and his two little young elementary age grandkids doing it. And I visited with him for a few minutes and he likes to do that every year on his birthday. And I can see why, because when you're at the top, it is a stupendous view. And it just really was a nice way to punctuate the end of my trip in Phoenix. So I wanna thank all the small businesses that I visited with in Phoenix while I was there. It enhanced my trip and it enhanced my fiber art world to where just to see the inner workings of things or to be inspired to learn or see how to do things. So I definitely want to spend time with a Native American Navajo weaver who not only will show me how to weave, but help incorporate the life and the lifestyle of the Navajo weaving. So that really happened to me there. Um, to visit with Ken of KCL Woods, of course I was on a high. Like I told him, you are my Elvis Presley because I'm like, oh, the spindle I use every day. And here he is with his hands working on mine, you know, cleaning it up from all the times I dropped it and just all his other beautiful spindles. So that was just like through the roof great. and. I bought a couple more spindles and they actually even work better than the one that I had. They're a little bit heavier, so they spin so much longer. So that was fantastic. Yeah, to be on the farms with the animals, great. Thank you, Sonia, for that and the Tunis sheep. Wonderful. I'm glad to see all that she's doing for that region. And then Cheryl with the dying. Okay, now I've got the itch and I am gathering my supplies and I am going to learn how to natural dye my own cotton. And I just learned that the people there are very friendly and the area is just stunningly beautiful with the mountains and the scenery. So, you know, and I went there in January and the weather was fabulous. A little bit cool, perfect. I'd rather have it that way than too hot. So thank you for joining me on the travel adventures to Phoenix, Arizona. All right, happy fiber travel.
and thanks for watching. If you're enjoying this programming, I invite you to become a supporting member. There are a couple of ways you could help out. You can go to my website, rehashfiber.com, and under supporting members, it takes you to Patreon, where you can give as little as $3 a month. If you sign up to Patreon, you get a little thank you gift of the Rehash Fiber pin, and that's mailed within the United States only. The other way you can help out, also through my website, is check out the merchandise. There is a ton of fun things, from t-shirts, water bottles, coffee bags, project bags, and more. So your support will go to the fees that it takes to keep this going every month, products and road shows and more. So thank you for any amount of support and thanks for watching.